Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks to everyone joining us either via Facebook or Zoom for this month's Wait What, which is a conversation on gender care and unpaid labor. My name is Nicole Young-Martin, and I serve as a Community Investments Manager for the Women's Fund of Western Massachusetts. For almost 25 years, your Women's Fund has provided community investments in the form of grants, capacity building, workshops, hosting convenings around specific topics, and uplifting women and girls serving organizations around strategic priorities, including economic security, addressing parity in positions of power, and freedom from gender-based violence. Our Wait What series allows us to further engage members of our community on how these issues directly impact those we serve and to provide resources on how to best address these disparities. We wanna take this moment to give a special thank you to our underwriters, the Jamrock Group, Institute for Generative Leadership, and People's Bank for their continued support of women and girls in Western Massachusetts. It is because of them that programs such as our Wait What series are provided complimentary to our community. While issues like the pay gap and women's unpaid and unappreciated care work have been conversation points for multiple decades, this past year, um, there has been more of an emphasis on the prominence of this disparity. With the necessary reshaping of the economy the pandemic has brought, it's the perfect opportunity to reshape women's relationship with the economy as well. We wanted to take an opportunity to have a conversation about how the disparities women experience in the economy affects us both systemically and at home. Today's conversation will feature Dr. Nancy Fulbrook, the director of a research program at the Political Economy Research Institute, which is based at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and our very own CEO, Donna Hagigat. Dr. Forbra is a highly accomplished professor and researcher who specializes in studying women's roles in the political economy, specifically in the care sector and the patriarchal systems that inhibit them. In Dr. Forbra's Care Talk blog, she discusses the role of and obstacles facing women economically from the intersectional political economy to the finitely um, elastic safety net that is the willingness to provide unpaid care for others. Our CEO, Donna, came to the Women's Fund with over 12 years of experience developing programs, launching startups, fundraising, and building advocacy programs. Under her leadership, we have successfully launched the Young Women's Initiative, which will be beginning its fifth year for girls and young women of color in Springfield, focused on gender and racial equity, and moving our focus towards fostering strategic partnerships and community investing. Please visit our website to read their bios in their entirety. At the end of our conversation, we will open it up to respond to questions from our viewers, both from Facebook and also from Zoom. If you have any questions, especially as they emerge, please feel free to type them in the chat feature um, for those on Zoom and in the comment section of the video feed for those of you joining us from Facebook. We will be holding, prompting these questions to Donna and Dr. Fulber for the end of the conversation. We hope that today's event inspires and informs dialogue that needs to start in the home, at work, with friends and other loved ones. We have so much to cover today, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Donna. Thank you, Nicole, and welcome, Nancy. We're so excited to have this conversation together. And I just have to share with everyone that Nancy and I actually, even though we're both situated in Western Massachusetts, we met in New York State uh, at an Omega Women and Power Gathering Our Strength Conference. And we didn't meet in the usual way. We actually met over dinner in the dining hall. It was one of those, oh, is this seat taken opportunities? <laughs> and uh, we found out that we had a lot in common in terms of what we were interested in uh, in changing in the world. And Nancy has been at uh, feminist economics uh, for her career and also talking about the care economy and researching the care economy since way before the COVID pandemic. But of course, now uh, with the COVID pandemic, there has been uh, new interest and emphasis about uh, what is happening with the care economy and how we should be reframing things with that in mind. And so along those lines, Nancy, I wanted to start with this first question, which is how are you seeing and how do you expect to see changes in how we are framing and addressing 
value and care in our economy as a result of COVID-19 and also the racial reckoning? Well, first of all, I, I want to just say thank you for this opportunity. It it's, um, feels really good to have an opportunity to have a little outreach to the community. And I, I really respect and admire the work that the Women's Fund has been doing on a, on a number of different levels. So um, hopefully we can strengthen that really good connection that uh, first happened over really good Omega food. <laughs> um, you know, the, the COVID-19 pandemic really dramatized the importance of family care and unpaid work because that turned out to be the kind of safety net uh, to which uh, everybody pretty much had to resort, especially with uh, school closings and, and daycare closings. And, um, you know, we would have been really lost without it, but it came at a, a pretty serious cost. Uh, and we still haven't quite gotten past it in the sense that um, a lot of women were forced to leave paid employment and women's employment is still lagging far below what it was before the, the, um, the pandemic uh, started. But the good thing I think is that it's increased awareness of the importance of, uh, you know, really just how indispensable family care unpaid work is. And so things are happening on a number of different levels. One thing that's happening is I think the uh, Democratic Party has really taken the initiative to propose some uh, very momentous legislation. It's still in process and it's not clear how it's gonna shake out, but I think uh, it's pretty historic and it's emphasis on ways of making it easier for parents in particular to combine paid work and unpaid work. Um, and it's also had a big impact on economists. Now the um, US Bureau of Labor Statistics is pursuing a project to actually estimate the value of unpaid household services uh, and make it part of the official statistical system. So that's uh, a really big deal. Oops, are you? Are you yeah, oops, yeah. you think I'd get this right by now. <laughs> we talk about the care economy but can you help us understand what exactly is comprised uh, when, when we're thinking of the care economy, what does that traditionally mean for, for lay folks? Well, uh, let me say first, it's sort of a new term and it's evolving. Um, and I, the way I use it is to describe both unpaid work uh, that happens in families and communities, but also the paid work of care that daycare workers, that elder care workers, teachers, nurses do. And I think, you know, there are important synergies between paid care and unpaid care. They kind of are mutually dependent on one another. And, um, and there are a lot of similarities. I mean, obviously they're, they're different, um, but almost all care work is done on a kind of personal basis, face-to-face, -face, first name basis. And it, um, you know, it's really producing something really important, namely human capabilities um, that aren't directly valued in the market economy. It's, a, it's, it's an interesting thing to think about. And I think one of the things that was interesting that you had been writing about in your, uh, your most recent book is uh, how some feminist economists talked about, I think it was constructive, no, compulsory altruism. Yes. And when you think about that concept and you think about COVID-19, can you talk a little bit more about what you see that looking like? right now for women? Well, compulsory altruism is, is just really about a kind of a moral obligation that's so you know expected by society that people have very little choice uh, but, but to conform to it. And it, it's often distributed kind of unequally. So in general, women are held to a higher standard of care for dependence than men are. And you know, it's really a violation of femininity not to be responsive to a needy child or a needy uh, family member. And I think that's one of the things that's getting kind of renegotiated culturally as well as economically. And, and COVID-19, I think, ha has contributed to that because I think, you know, for the first time, many men were forced to spend more time at home mm -hmm. and to actually see what the responsibilities of family care and of um, 
you know, just keeping, keeping life going to see how time consuming they could be. So I think that's um, kind of in a way contributed to more proactive thinking about, about bargaining over who will do what. Mm -hmm. And for those who are on with us, either on Facebook or on Zoom, if you feel as though over the last year and a half or so since COVID has come on board, uh, that you feel in some ways that you were a victim of that feminine compulsory altruism. And we'd love to hear a little bit in the chats, uh, what in the chat section, what kinds of things you felt that you were really burdens that were placed on you by virtue of your gender and things that just needed to be done, whether it was taking care of children or taking older relatives to be vaccinated and so forth. We'd, we'd love to hear uh, some comments about that for sure. Nancy, I know that uh, last year, or maybe it's actually probably a little bit over a year ago, I had spoken with you about the work that the Women's Fund is doing around the uh, creating a women's economic security hub in the Springfield area. And one of the things I really appreciated was our conversation about how we think about what that does to a woman's bandwidth. Uh, what And when I say that, I mean things around what we ultimately ended up calling unpaid caregiving. Uh, and I think originally when I spoke with you, we talked about this term of unpaid, uh, I think it was household production and unpaid labor. And then we kind of synthesized that ultimately into unpaid caregiving. Do mm -hmm. you think that some of what we're seeing with the great resignation, you know, putting on your economist lens uh, as you do, do you think some of that is certainly the sort of burnout from uh, this unpaid caregiving and navigating everything else. Are you seeing early signs of that or, or what are your thoughts on that? I think it's, it, there's a kind of a confluence of factors that's driving the great resignation. You know, part of it is just frustration with the quality of a lot of low paid jobs um, and a kind of, uh, um, emerging culture of resistance uh, to that. Mm -hmm. And part of it is just constraint that, that uh, given the lack of childcare facilities and the uncertainty about school schedules and who knows what's gonna happen next month, right? It begins to seem just too difficult um, to continue to juggle paid work and, and, and unpaid work. Um, and I think there is also a sense of, of, of burnout with unpaid uh, work responsibilities, but there's also I don't know, I think there's, I think we've kind of reached a point where um, the, the structure of our social institutions makes it hard for people to combine paid and unpaid work in a sustainable way. Okay. No, you can't really work 40 hours a week at a paid job and also um, co cover the basic, your, your own needs for self-care, much less those of others. but. There's a huge penalty in the labor market for working less than full time. Often means lower pay, less access to benefits, zero career chances and stuff. So in my opinion, one of the things that might come out of this is more, more, um, uh, more support for reducing uh, work hours uh, and making the whole job uh, kind of job job time, job demands thing, more, more flexible with fewer penalties. Mm -hmm. So let's keep our fingers crossed about that because that yeah. would be a really good outcome. Right, and that would include uh, obviously, all oh, right, I say obviously, but <laughs> let me get your answer to this. Uh, do you envision that that would include gig workers? So a lot of women who are patching together two and three jobs doing different things that um, maybe most of those jobs may not even have benefits necessarily. Um, how do you see that? Well, how that it, you know, if you look at, if you look at the American job market, there's kind of a time crisis at both ends. So yeah. if, if you're in a high end job, you're expected to work more than 40 hours a week and, and typical demands are like more like 50 to 60. So you're working more hours really than you than you want to and at the low end you don't have enough hours so you have to have multiple jobs in order to uh piece together a living 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and with a lot of just-in-time scheduling, a lot of unpredictability, a lot of insecurity, uh, and right like that. So neither of those neither of those packages is really very sustainable. Uh, and I think that's why we need to be thinking more proactively and creatively about um, greater flexibility without the penalty of insecurity and low pay. And what are some of the most promising solutions that you're seeing uh, to kind of uh, treat? uh, To make that happen? Yeah. Well, um, you know, one solution is always having more public policies that encourage that. Like, for instance, you could uh, require employers to offer prorated benefits if they're hiring somebody part time. They can't just exclude them from benefits. If they're working half time, they should get half the benefit package. That's kind of a simple policy solution that some co- countries have adopted. But I think what's actually really happening now is that there's a labor shortage. And so Um, that's enabling workers to bargain either through unions or individually for schedule changes and more workplace flexibility. It's kind of an informal process. It's hard to tell exactly, you know, it's hard to map it, right? But there are just a lot of signs that labor shortages give uh, workers just individual, uh, you know, negotiating power with employers. So if they really need you to work and you only want to work 30 hours a week, you can ask for that and you might be able to get it. Um, So we don't really know how that's going to shake out, but um, it's something everybody should be thinking about. Interesting. And do you think that the availability of remote work is something that is also going to play to... uh, one of the solutions I would say maybe to yeah. this time. Yeah, bargaining for being able to work at home several days a week is already happening. I mean, you can really see this in the business press where mm-hmm. employers are saying, God, you got to offer it or you can't get them, you know, you can't sign them up. Right. So right. Um, just tells you something about how uh, the forces of supply and demand in the labor market can really alter the balance of power. Mm-hmm. And with the labor market, it seems as though like wages from what I've been reading have been stagnant for quite a while for the labor market. And do you think that in some ways that this is a, a necessary correction where employers are having to yeah. are pay pay more, right? Yeah, especially for uh, low-end workers, pretty significant pay increases have come into play and that is a very good change. Uh, mm-hmm. And it, it, it does a lot to compensate those low wage workers uh, for the high rate of inflation mm-hmm. that's um, been set into motion by shortages this fall. So it's a very good, yeah, I think it's a very good thing. Nancy, I do want to get in a question that our intern, Michaela, who used to, oh, who is an alum of our Young Women's uh, Initiative, had uh, written in. And her question is, in what ways do you think intersectionality, such as race, sexuality, or class, affects feminist econ- economics, excuse me, and does feminist economics do a sufficient job, including all? If so, n- if not, how could it expand its reach in order to do so? That's such a tough question. Um, <laughs> I, I think, uh, you know, intersectional political economy is really important, and I now use it to describe my work rather than feminist economics, because I think it's uh, it's a broader rubric. And I think the interaction between race, ethnicity, uh, gender, class, citizenship, it really helps explain the current political um, kind of standoff in the US. And we, re- we really need to pay attention to all those dimensions of group identity and how they, how they interact. Um, I think it'll be a while before feminist economics as a kind of field really, uh, really figures out how to div- how to promote a really intersectional approach. I think there's a lot of intellectual inertia and uh, a lot of resistance to change. So I think we have to keep pushing on that issue. Um, I do think it's moving in the right direction. That that's that's one thing I'll say. I think it's, I think it's on the move. 
So one of the, I appreciate, by the way, that um, you would like to be uh, introduced as an intersectional economist and not no longer just a feminist economist. One of the things I remember from, from when you gave your uh, speech at uh, Omega was the putting the heart back in economics, right? Yeah. And you talked about the invisible heart and I think that that was probably a play on Adam Smith's The Invisible Hand, but can you share with um, the folks on our Zoom today what you mean by the invisible heart and why, why we need to focus on that? Well, it's really important because modern economics pays so little attention to it. Uh, you know, if even in a very introductory economics class, you'll hear a lecture saying people are self-interested, uh, they don't care about other people, we're going to treat them as though all they want to do is maximize their own personal happiness, and in the marketplace, they don't really care about anything else. But in, in reality, actually, concern for other people is really critical to the functioning of the economy. And I think, you know, COVID-19 has really also really dra dramatized that, you know, just all of the essential workers who showed up on the job, including um, nurses and physicians, you know, just tremendous stress and tremendous threat to their own health. Um, but also the people who kept driving delivery trucks or, you know, showing up to package groceries, you know, who could have opted out. In a way, you know, people's desire to be of use and to be good people kind of helps blunt the impact of a lot of institutions that would otherwise be really exploitative and really harsh. Um, there's something that um, uh, is actually sometimes called the moral underground, you know, the, the, the way that this is something that sociologist Lisa Dodson has talked about, you know, the way an individual supervisor will cut a worker some slack or, you know, the way somebody at a call center will actually <laughs> give you some like really personal support. Uh, and we don't think enough about what kinds of institutions can encourage and foster that kind of behavior. And I think as a result, uh, kind of, we, we're living in a world in which people seem increasingly aggressive and poorly behaved. Mm -hmm. And I think we're, we're all noticing how, not just political polarization, but just kind of lack of trust and lack of empathy for other people is very toxic. Mm -hmm. The whole social environment is imp impoverished by it. Um, and I think it it's a little bit like climate change. That That's a metaphor that I really like. You know, uh, it's taken us a long time to figure out what the unintended consequences of many of our environmental decisions are, but it's pretty clear that they're cumulatively undermining the stability of our, of our climate in ways that are gonna be really costly. And it's the same thing about trust and care for other people. Uh, that's a social climate and it affects everything. It's not just the care sector or, you know, not just care work directly, it affects everything, right? And if we don't value it and, and um, celebrate it and reinforce it, um, it, we're gonna use it up. I mean, it's not an infinite resource. It's, it's vulnerable to depletion. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something that we really need to think about. And we know that poverty and inequality and insecurity make, the, make those problems worse. You know, it just empirically, there's a lot of evidence in communities that experience those problems. There's a lot more by way of drug addiction and mm -hmm. um, mental health problems and so forth and so on. So you know, wow, that's just something, the social environment is something we need to be much more mindful of. Nancy, I see that our friend Wendy has put into the chat 
Rianne Eisler's Nurturing Our Humanity book. And I know that uh, you and I had spoken about that because actually I met Nancy because she was actually filling in for Rianne, who was supposed to speak uh, uh, at Omega. Yeah. And I too, yeah. Wendy, appreciated that that book quite a bit because it does, yeah. uh, you know, speak about uh, uh, examples of, uh, you know, communities in the world that are are much more, I guess, appreciative of care and and that kind yeah. of work. That of sort of that competitive uh, alternative, I guess, right? Yeah, I think Rian really deserves a lot of credit for being such an enthusiastic and tireless promoter of caring values. Um, uh, she's she's a pretty epic thinker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. And I, I thank our women's fund team. Someone had put into the um, into the chat as well, the moral underground by Lisa Dotson. So they put yeah. a link to, to the book as well. Which oh, good. It's, yeah, it's a, it's also a really good book. Mm -hmm. It sort of makes you uh, more observant of the texture of daily life, mm -hmm. uh, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're almost at the halfway mark of our talk, and I wanted to just pause here to ask Nicole and Kelly, do we have any questions uh, uh, coming in from Facebook Live? I don't think I saw questions on Zoom, but I wanted to pause to see there. None yet uh, from Facebook Live. And none yet from Zoom, but I would love to encourage those that are joining us from either platform don't wait until the end to um, pose your questions in the chat because we may be able to integrate them into today's conversation. Yeah, good point. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. And yes, I will join uh, the bandwagon and do uh, encourage folks to ask us questions. And Nancy, uh, you before in our pre-chat, uh, before our official start of our conversation, you mentioned that you were at work writing another book. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that book? Yeah, sure. I, you know, I am really trying to uh, persuade my fellow economists uh, to take uh, care work seriously. And unpaid work has generally been excluded uh, in a variety of ways from the whole discussion. So I want to bring that in. And also, I think um, there's there hasn't been enough attention among economists about um, disagreement over who should pay the cost of care. Mm. Uh, it's almost like, it's just a choice. People choose, if they choose to have a baby, it's like choosing to buy a sports car, choosing to buy a pet. You know, they if they chose to do it, they should take responsibility for it without very much attention. I mean, like with pretty much zero attention to what the social value and public contribution of de developing children's capabilities is. And the fact that we all, all benefit, the kind of the public good aspects uh, mm -hmm. of care revision, care provision. And also how much of the kind of political, how, how much of political disagreement is not just over um, wages and profits, but who should pay for education? Who should, who should be taxed for childcare? Who should, mm -hmm. who should pay the cost of caring for the environment? And I, you know, the state and public policy has become the site for a, a kind of distributional conflict. And not mm -hmm. surprisingly, we see a big gender gap in political mm -hmm. preferences and a big gap based on, on race and ethnicity and a big gap based on um, class position and, and citizenship. And I think the ways those things work together um, to lead to political coalitions and standoffs are really important. And that, um, you know, I think we, in a way we kind of need to negotiate a better social contract, you know, like here's some work, it really needs to be done. It can't be done entirely through the market. It can't be done entirely through the family. It requires collaboration across a lot of different sites. You know, how do we think these should fit together and to be more mindful of the, um, you know, uh, of the big picture really, instead of just taking little pieces of the problem. So we do have some good questions coming in, which I'm gonna to get to uh, next. And one thing that you mentioned was policy solutions and, 
you know, you just kind of ended your last thought mm -hmm. on this idea of bits and pieces. And I think sometimes though, when we're trying to do things in the policy arena, we don't quite realize the impact. So one thing that I've always been kind of aware of is uh, how with, for instance, early childhood daycare workers, uh, we have, um, in, you know, depending on the state you live in, uh, ratcheted up the certifications and requirements uh, for what a daycare worker has to have, like it has to be an associate's degree or or whatever. Yeah. And yet we've done nothing to give them more money in their paychecks to accommodate them for the extra expense that they've uh, they've incurred. And what are your thoughts about that sort of policy, not in a vacuum, but not fully understanding you know, that these are low wage jobs to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. Child care workers and elder care workers are among the most poorly paid relative to the value they create, I think. And I think it's very encouraging that on the federal level, there have been efforts to address that problem, that part of the Build Back Better legislative initiative is to increase wages for uh, child care workers. And also the increase in funding for home and community-based services mm -hmm. um, was designed to also improve wages for uh, uh, direct care for uh, elderly and people with disabilities in their own homes. Um, so uh, it's, hard, it's hard to make things like that uh, happen on the state level, but it's not impossible. State, state minimum wage, uh, maybe even uh, pushing for a higher minimum for minimum wage for care workers, uh, providing more support for public education and access to better credential jobs. You know, more more collaboration between um, the state university system and the and the um, the care economy as a whole. I think uh, could really be a big plus. And you know the state Massachusetts has has taken a big step forward with investment in childcare, but it turns out that um, I don't know if you've read anything about it, but there's a lot of concern about the unintended consequences of public subsidies for early childhood education, uh, and it's I think it's a very interesting example of how you you need you need really need to think about the economics. So here's the story. A lot of family daycare centers uh, use the uh, tuition they get for caring for toddlers to cross subsidize the care for infants. It's much more expensive to care for very young children because of the regulatory requirements for a higher staffing ratio. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of these daycare centers had worked out a system where they the prices didn't exactly reflect the costs. And if you had, you know, a two-year-old, um, you might be paying, a, you know, not a whole lot more than for a four-year-old, uh, even though the costs of caring for the two-year-old are a lot higher, okay. So then when Massachusetts subsidized, provided more subsidized early childhood care for four and five years, year, for three and four, three and a half and four-year-olds, right, that meant, that uh, parents were less likely to take them to those local daycare centers. So they could no longer cross subsidize the care for younger kids. And this was particularly true in black and Hispanic communities in Boston that lost a lot of their family daycare centers as a result. So, so the ad hoc, you know, it's a very disorganized kind of ad hoc industry. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's very vulnerable to kind of dislocation yeah. By, by policies that are not well thought out. So it's kind of a reason to have a more coordinated mm -hmm. national strategy rather than just a little patchwork approach. Yeah. In that instance, it sounds like their business model was basically destroyed by this, you know, yeah. So let me get to our couple of questions. First from Chris, our friend Kristen, I'd love Dr. Fulbright to unpack the solutions more, public policy, flexible employment, and any others. How realistic does she think these are and what does she feel has been happening around these on different levels? I, I think it's pretty realistic. There's already a lot of evidence that, that highly educated women in professional and managerial jobs 
are often able to bargain for paid leave, for more workplace flexibility, um, for um, on-site childcare and so forth and so on. The, the real problem has been extending those policies beyond the very top of the professional managerial pyramid to everybody else. And hopefully, as we were saying earlier, labor shortages and better bargaining power are gonna make that a little bit easier. But there also has to be public support. There has to be public recognition of the importance of care work. And I think that's often kind of missing um, when people hear about um, care work or the care economy, they often think very narrowly about healthcare or you know something that you pay for rather than something that you provide. So building a better communication strategy around the oh. importance of care work is, is really important. And I, I don't think voters are gonna get behind the policies we need oh. unless we can see it you know, explain it as social infrastructure that mm -hmm. uh, promotes economic growth, not just a giveaway to, uh, you know, people, people um, who are making kind of private choices that we don't want to subsidize, right? We, we really need to emphasize that social investment dimension. Of yeah, I like that term social infrastructure. I think that that um, in some ways is, uh, more intriguing as well uh and, yeah. and less uh to your point people don't have an image that comes to their mind with that social infrastructure i think people think oh what is that and then and you know kind of makes them think a little bit yeah perhaps. Mm -hmm. so we have another question from audrey who's uh, also currently interning with us and is also an alum of our young women's initiative and her question is around policy as well it is what policy on the local level within Massachusetts could help relieve some of the pressures of unpaid care work? What can be done on the executive and legislative level? Well, I have to say, I'm not, I'm not an expert on um, Massachusetts public policy. Mm -hmm. Most of the time I've spent over my lifetime has been begging the legislature for more funding for, for higher education. Um, I, I mean, Massachusetts is is pretty good relative to other states, and in a, in a lot of different ways. But um, yeah, it's 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 clearly still not there. So pressures of unpaid care work. Well, uh, expanding eligibility for childcare and trying to make create a healthy childcare industry that extends to under. Uh, under-resourced communities, that would be a, a really big one. Um, I think uh, more generous family and sick leave policies are really key. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an important part of, of the temporal flexibility that people need in order to do, to, do, to take care of, of unpaid uh, care work. And a lot of the action in sick leave and paid family leave policies has been happening on, on the state level. And I think Massachusetts could improve uh, in that department as well. That could be a big step forward. Um, uh, the state minimum wage, living wage campaigns are relevant. Ability to earn more, uh, you know, ability to empower workers at the bottom of the of the wage distribution uh, could could be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. You know, just just recognizing and documenting the amount of unpaid work that gets done in the Commonwealth. Mm. You know, what does it contribute to the Commonwealth? I mean, there's data from the um, American Time Use Survey that can be analyzed for the state, we could ask really what, what is the value added of unpaid care work in the state? What would you have to pay people to do it if people stop doing it basically for free? Mm. Uh, I think that could help get, uh, get people's attention. Uh, what percentage of employment in Massachusetts is employment and care industries? What are the relative you know, um, earnings and working conditions uh, in the state, in those care jobs. I know 
there was an unsuccessful attempt to increase nurse staffing ratios in Massachusetts. And it's really coming around to haunt us because as you, I'm sure you've read in the, in the press, uh, there's now a very big nursing shortage because a lot of nurses have just basically retired early or quit under, under stress. Uh, and I think we need to be listening on the state level, listening to care workers in particular and what they say about uh, their working conditions as well as their pay. Nancy, uh, we do have another question coming in and I wanna get to that. I just wanted to follow up on a couple of things that you were talking about. One is the survey that you mentioned, it was American and I didn't ca catch it. The, Amer the American time use survey. What's the second word again? <laughs> Time use. Oh, time use. Okay, two words. Yeah. That's one. So Perfect. here's like, here, yeah. shall I give you an example? Yes, yes. Okay. I'm going to ask you what you did yesterday, but mm -hmm. I don't want to violate any confidentiality. <laughs> so you don't have to give honest answers. What right. time did you wake up yesterday? 6, 6, 15 a.m. And what did you do? Got up, uh, got ready and walked my dog. And what did you do after that? Got to work. Uh, how did you travel to work? I walked across my house. <laughs> and how long did that take you? Uh, 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, you didn't eat breakfast? Donna, you're supposed to eat breakfast. I eat breakfast later usually. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, all right, so you got to the office and then you engaged in your pay paid employment. And how yes. long did you do that? Mm -hmm. Well, you mean before I took a break or? For yeah, the, before you took a break, yeah. Uh, probably an hour. Okay, then you took a break. How long a break did you take? Probably 10 minutes. <laughs> and what, what were you doing during that break? Eating. <laughs> <laughs> Good, you gotta eat. Yeah. Um, and what did you do after that? Went back to work. <laughs> and how long did you, did? how long were you at your desk oh, working? Wow, uh, probably maybe four hours before I took a break again. Okay, yeah. all right, you get the idea. Yes. So if, if you agree to participate in this survey, somebody talks to you on the phone, right. and, they, and they try to nail down everything that you did in the, previ the previous day from when you woke yeah. up to when you went to sleep. Yeah. Uh, including, you know, with special questions about, uh, you know, what was a child under the age of 13 in your care while you were mm -hmm. doing those things? Ah, that's a really great question. So you can actually see what, um, you know, how much time people are spending to child on, on child care and, and supervision of children and elder care and cooking meals and shopping. And, you know, on the national level, what the results show is that hours that are devoted to unpaid work are about equal on average to hours devoted to paid work. Yeah. So... Now yeah. that's partly because of students and retired people spend, you know, when people retire, they, they, they have less money and they spend more time doing unpaid work um, to kind of make ends meet. Mm -hmm. um, but still, it's sort of amazing if you think about it, the most advanced affluent capitalist economy in the world, half of all work. And work is defined as something you could pay somebody else in principle to do for you. So it, it doesn't include sleeping or, or leisure time or studying, yeah. it's, it's work, right? And it's half yeah. of all the work that gets done. Wow, that is amazing. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And our, our, our amazing team, they found uh, the link to that and they put it in the chat for those uh, who are interested. And our friend Wendy has a question that really gets to, you know, what we've been talking about today is really a little bit more kind of immediate short term around unpaid care and uh, disruptions in ability to do work and so forth. And I think her question is getting a little bit more at uh, the long-term financial effects of women having to be in and out of the workforce. Her, her, here is her question. Often some are in and out of the work, women are in and out of the workforce much more than men. So their overall earnings are less. Is there something that can be done to equalize this? Well, what you have to do is, is reduce the in and out. And the way to reduce the in and out is to have uh, flexibility so that you can take some time 
I mean, you know, that's essentially what what paid leave does. It means you can take some time out from work and come back to the same job. Mm -hmm. And it's very clear that that improves your, you know, lifetime earnings trajectory to be able to do that. And we know that from looking at European economies where that's pretty standard. So Mm -hmm. a lot of the in and out that we see among women is a result of the lack of paid family leave and the lack of, of flexibility. Uh-huh. That, that we're talking about. Yeah, employers are always going to pay a, something of a premium for uh, continuity on the job because it's it increases their bottom line, improves their bottom line. Uh-huh. So, you know, that's why it's so important to to kind of reorganize our, our work routines so that uh, it's not an all or nothing choice. Uh-huh. Uh, Nancy, you talked uh, a few times now about paid family leave, family family medical leave, uh, things like that. And I wonder sometimes, should we be looking at that radically differently? Uh, For instance, we built our family leave and our paid leave really around sickness and sort of critical care, urgent care that can't be met otherwise. Are there other economies in the world that take a different approach that's a little bit more, I don't want to say positive, but are more around uh, reflecting the realities that if we have children or adults who need care, it isn't necessarily always an urgent, uh, critical sickness-based care. And can we build policies around that? Yeah, sure. We. We can build pol- we need to imagine the policies we want as a first step uh, uh, to pushing for them. And I think there's variation across states and what it, in terms of what qualifies as a need to, uh, to take a leave from work. But a big step forward in the US was making it clear that it doesn't have to be just for childcare. Uh, mm-hmm. And it can be, nor, nor does it necessarily need to be for, you know, blood can, Mm -hmm. Uh, and thinking about broadening that to kind of uh, family, friends, and community care would be, I think, a really good step. Yeah, definitely. Are there other thoughts that are percolating in your mind, Nancy? Well, I also have a, you know, I also think we should be talking about um, mandatory public service uh, as a, as a, a possible strategy. I know people don't like the idea of, of a draft or being required to do something, but I think giving people, requiring people to have some experience taking care of other people who are very different than they are, I just think it could be really helpful. It could increase, you know, it could, it could do a lot of good. Um, and, uh, if we're willing to, if we were willing to provide more generous access to education uh, and health care for the younger generation, I think we should be asking something in return. And I think asking for some contributions to public care, public care service would be a very good trade. Would you think about something like a sort of a domestic peace corps? Is that what you're yeah. envisioning? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And do you know of other economies that do something similar? I know we know other economies that do the similar. Yeah, it, happens on a very, it happens on a small yeah. scale and on a kind of volunteer scale. Um, okay. And I think maybe, you know, some things like that kind of emerged as an alternative to the military draft where you had people saying, okay, I understand I have a responsibility here, but I don't want to be involved in the military. So mm-hmm. that, that, that was just, that's sort of the little precedent for, for um, creating opportunities for public service, yeah. I have another question that just came in and is what about ways in which we can shift the culture so that the care work is not solely women's domain? Oh, we just, we need to write songs and poems and uh, (laughs) screenplays uh, about a different set, an emerging set of cultural values. And I think that's already happening to some extent, but mostly I think we have to negotiate with our family and friends and every once in a while, just say, wait a minute, no way, you know, wait a minute, you know, 
yeah, let's do it together. Or, you know, wait a minute. Or what's the, uh, what's the name of the series? Wait, what? Wait, what? Right. <laughs> wait, what? You it's want me to cook dinner tonight? Wait, <laughs> what? <laughs> well, and you had wanted to add the why. So maybe the answer should be, wait, what? Why not you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <of me. laughs> yeah. And I, I think actually, you know, that's the sign of a good relationship to be able to say, to just say, hey, let's just interrogate a little bit. What's the deal? Yeah. Um, that's how we yeah. that's how we learn together. That's how we grow together, I think, is through right. that. It doesn't have to be, you know, it doesn't have to be an unpleasant process. It can, and be, I think that, it can be kind of fun. Yeah. yeah, and I think that that culture work needs to happen with both genders, right? I think that I've seen articles about how men are not taking paternity leave even when it's offered because it doesn't seem like it's, if most men aren't taking it, why am I going to be the one right. that takes it? The but there's a big generational uh, divide. Yeah, young yeah. young men are much more they're much more hip to this. I, I, I just can't tell you in my experiences teaching, I've seen yeah. very steady, uh, you know, really big changes in that department. So mm -hmm. I, I'm a big fan of the younger generation relative to my generation, at least. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I didn't so know that. Kristen says our own Senator didn't take paternity leave. Yeah, I think he should be, I think we should out him as much as you can about that. Well, especially since he's going to be right. I mean, not that I, I think he's doing great work, but he is also running for lieutenant governor. So hopefully, uh, you know, he'll think about some of these changing dynamics and what he can do personally to be a, a role model, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. Nancy, um, any final thoughts that you have on our conversation? Uh, that you want to leave folks with and and of course we'll be interested to uh, have you back when you have uh, completed your book to to hear more about uh, you know kind of how that's evolved but final thoughts with us now uh, no real final thoughts just happy to keep in touch and uh, you know really good people ask really good questions uh, let me know if there are things about kind of local economic research uh, that I might be able to help out with and I think all politics is local and we have a really great community and uh, I'm very grateful for it. Well, that's awesome. And we are very grateful to have you in our community, in our backyard and willing to come and share your expertise and also your evolving insights like uh, the idea of public service uh, that is, uh, let's say, emphasizing social infrastructure. Yes, exactly. So, so that's awesome. So Nicole, I want to turn it back to you. Uh, Nancy, we are excited to get you back for another Wait What uh, at, in the future. And Nicole, we will uh, bring it to you so that folks can get to their one o'clock meetings or or maybe even eat and, and enjoy a, a little bit of time to themselves. <laughs> And stretch and wherever you are, get some sun. I'm in Connecticut and the sun just peaked out. So hopefully people yeah, can yeah. get some sun in. And Dr. Forber, your statement around um, politics is local is exactly why we started Wait What. We wanted to make sure that people were educated on the issues that were um, relevant and important to us. And mm -hmm. I want to thank you so much for taking the time out for being here today as I sit and look at the invisible heart on my bookshelf. <laughs> I've had it that book for a while. <laughs> oh, well, thanks for making it happen, Nicole. Yeah, I'm such a huge fan. And thank you so much, Donna, for leading today's conversation. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so everyone, please be sure to check out our website at mywomensfund.org. We have a plethora of amazing things coming up in the spring, including capacity building workshops, updates on our Young Women's Initiative program and also a wait what schedule for the spring. So have a great afternoon to those who celebrate, have an amazing holiday among the plethora of holidays that are coming up and see everyone in 2022.